Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to Highland Presbyterian Church's uh, online uh, virtual worship service. Uh, we can't be together in person, but we're glad that you have uh, made the choice to join us uh, today as we come together uh, to worship. And as we uh, enter into this time of worship, uh, I'd invite you all to pray with me. And we'll end this prayer with the Lord's Prayer. And whether you're by yourself, with your family, um, in the car, wherever uh, you are, uh, I invite you to say it with me. Healing and empowering God, we are sometimes so sure that things will not work out, uh, that we even doubt your ability, your ability to put things right in our lives. Uh, we often lack faith, God. But Jesus came to show us that even our most dreaded enemy, death, can be overcome uh, by faith. So, Lord, we ask that you would heal our doubts and our longings for assurance and give us spirits of trust and of hope. We ask all this in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, Father who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed, hallowed be, thy be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, come thy, thy will be done, done on earth, earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. If you were with us last week, uh, you might remember that I said, uh, because we're used to having three services every Sunday, and now we're having a, a virtual one every weekend, we're going to be rotating who is leading us in music on a weekly basis. And so uh, this week, we uh, are blessed to have members of the Second Mob Band here to lead us in worship, and I'm going to turn it over to them. Thank you, Reverend Chip. Blessed be your name.
All right. Um, I, one thing I did forget to mention, especially if you are joining us and you're not normally uh, worshiping with us at the bottom of uh, the, the video in, in the sort of information section, there's a link to what, what we're calling a virtual contact card, and we'd love to be able to send you information and let you know what's going on in the life of our church. And so if you just click that link and fill it out, it takes about 20 seconds. Um, we'd really appreciate that. Um, but now we turn to Scripture, and our first reading uh, today, uh, Old Testament reading, comes from the book of the prophet Ezekiel. This is Ezekiel 37, verses 1 through 14. And I invite you to hear God's word for us this day. The Eternal had a hold on me, and I couldn't escape it. The divine wind of the Eternal One picked me up and set me down in the middle of the valley, but this time it was full of bones. God led me through the bones. There were piles of bones everywhere in the valley, dry bones left unburied. The Eternal One said to Ezekiel, Son of man, do you think these bones can live? Ezekiel answered, Eternal Lord, certainly you know the answer better than I do. And God responded, actually, I do. Prophecy to these bones, tell them to listen to what the Eternal Lord says to them. Dry bones, I will breathe breath into you, and you will come alive. I will attach muscles and tendons to you, cause flesh to grow over them, and cover you with skin. I will breathe breath into you and you will come alive. After this happens, you will know that I am the Eternal. So I did what God told me to do. I prophesied to the bones. As I was speaking, I heard a loud noise, a rattling sound, and all the bones began to come together and form complete skeletons. I watched and saw muscles and tendons attached to the bones, flesh grow over them, and skin wrap itself around the reforming bodies but there was still no breath in them. And God said again, prophecy to the breath. Speak, son of man, and tell them what the eternal Lord has to say. O oh, sweet breath, come from the four winds and breathe into these who have been killed. Make these corpses come alive. So I did what God told me to do. I prophesied to the breath. And as I was speaking, breath invaded the lifeless. The bodies came alive and stood on their feet. I realized then I was looking at a great army. And God said, Son of man, these bones are the entire community of Israel. They kept saying, Our bones are dry now, picked clean by scavengers. All hope is gone. Our nation is lost. And he told me to prophesy and tell them what he said. And the Eternal One said, Pay attention, my people. I am going to open your graves and bring you back to life. I will carry you straight back to the land of Israel. Then you will know that I am the Eternal One. I will breathe my spirit into you, and you will be alive once again. I will place you back in your own land. After that, you will know I, the Eternal, have done what I said I would do. So said the Eternal One. This is the word of the Lord. Thank Thanks you. be to God. And now uh, we have the words with our young church and Miss Jen. Well, good morning, friends. I hope everyone is doing great at home this morning. And since you guys are all at home, I had to invite the biggest kid in the whole crowd I could find to come help out today. And that would be Mr. Wayne. Mr. Wayne, how are you today? I'm great, Jim. Great. How are you? I am fantastic. Well, I brought a picture to show you this morning, okay. and I hope I don't stump you. Do you know what this is a picture of? An eggplant? It is not an eggplant. I don't know if you guys can see it at home. Strike one. Number two, what is it? A big above-ground potato. It is not an above-ground potato. Third try. Think springtime. Oh, springtime, springtime. Uh, I don't know. Do you need a hint? I do need a hint. It goes along with the butterfly life cycle. 
Do you not have you not been doing your homework at home and working on your science lessons? I haven't. I'm sorry. Well, those of you at home, I hope you can help out Mr. Wayne. If you cannot see this, this is actually a picture of a cocoon. And uh, an A for effort, but an E in science class this week, Mr. Wayne. So, you guys at home know what a cocoon is, unlike this silly guy back here. But some time ago, a caterpillar was crawling along the ground. Hold on. Do you know what that is? Uh, Maybe he forgot his glasses. I think that's what it is. That must be what it is. And this is a picture of a caterpillar for those of you at home. So, my caterpillar was crawling along the ground, and he began to spin that cocoon, or chrysalis, around himself. And if we were to open that up right now, we would see a lifeless blob of a creature. Gentlemen at home, I know you would love to do that, but let's leave the poor butterfly alone. It lies there and is motionless as if it were almost dead. What is happening is one of God's greatest miracles, a process called, I love this word, metamorphism. Just kind of, kind of sounds like a pretty cool word there. Can you say that one, Wayne? I'm not going to try it. Good answer. Good answer. So, I know that it sounds like a big fancy word, but all it means is change. A change is taking place. When springtime comes, the cocoon will break open. Okay, you cannot mess up this one. And what will come out? It's a moth. A beautiful moth or butterfly. <sighs> Jeez, we better take you back to science class. But what, guys, what looked at one point like something that was actually dead has come to life into an amazing creature. Well, the same thing happens to us in life. When we die, our bodies stay here and our souls go to heaven. It kind of is a sad story, but you have to think about the end goal. When your soul goes to heaven, you experience all the beautiful things and the fun experiences in heaven, the wonderful relationship that you will build with God. Someday, when Jesus comes back to earth, he will transform the person's body and all of us Christians will have resurrection bodies. Wayne, pretty cool, won't it be? That'll be an exciting day. That'll Hopefully you don't mess up that one. I hope I oh, don't. man. We will be far more beautiful than any butterfly. We will have a new resurrection body just like Jesus did after he was raised from the dead. So just remember that when a Christian dies, it is like the caterpillar going into the cocoon. But the same God who performs a miracle of having new life coming out of that lifeless cocoon also does all the great things we need in life. For the person who loves Jesus, death is not the end, but just the beginning of a marvelous new life forever in his presence. Well, friends, I really look forward to this staycation ending so I don't have to be stuck here with Mr. Wayne all the time because, boy, do I miss all of you guys. But please at home, go ahead, let's fold our hands and have a prayer together. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus I, am I am the resurrection, the resurrection. and the life because of you. Help me to remember to follow you and help others in need. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, now we have uh, our time of offering, and obviously uh, we can't uh, pass the plate, but at the end of uh, this video, uh, there will be a link to our online and text giving information, so feel free uh, to do that as you feel led. Grander earth has quaked before Moved by the sound of his voice Seas that are shaken can be calmed and broken for my regard and through it all through it all my eyes are on you through it all through it all it is well and through it all
even when my eyes can't see. And this mountain that's in front of me will be thrown into the midst of the sea. I think I figured out I do this so I don't have to do that. <laughs> yeah. um, our gospel this morning or today comes uh, from the gospel according to John. It's John chapter 11 verses 1 all, uh, all the way to 45 and since it is a long story I've asked members of the band uh, to help me and they'll be playing uh, different parts. I think you'll figure out uh, who they are. So hear uh, this word uh, from our scripture today. There was a certain man who was very ill. He was known as Lazarus from Bethany, which is the hometown of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary did a beautiful thing for Jesus. She anointed the Lord with a pleasant smelling oil and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus became deathly ill. So the sisters immediately sent a message to Jesus, which said, Lord, the one you love is very ill. Jesus heard the message. His sickness will not end in his death, but will bring great glory to God. As these events unfold, the Son of God will be exalted. 
Jesus dearly loved Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. However, after receiving this news, he waited two more days where he was. It is time to return to Judea. Teacher, the last time you were there, some Jews attempted to execute you by crushing you with stones. Why would you go back? There are 12 hours of daylight, correct? If anyone walks in the day, that person does not stumble because he or she sees the light of the world. If anyone walks at night, he will trip and fall because he does not have the right within. Our friend Lazarus has gone to sleep, so I will go to awaken him. Lord, if he is sleeping, then he will be all right. Jesus used sleep as a metaphor for death, but the disciples took him literally and did not understand. Then Jesus spoke plainly. Lazarus is dead, and I am grateful for your sakes that I was not there when he died. Now you will see and believe. Gather yourselves, and let's go to him. Let's go so we can die with him. As Jesus was approaching Bethany, which is about two miles east of Jerusalem, he heard that Lazarus had been in the tomb for four days. Now many people had come to comfort Mary and Martha as they mourned the loss of their brother. Martha went to meet Jesus when word arrived that he was approaching Bethany, but Mary stayed behind at the house. Lord, if you had been with us, my brother would not have died. Even so, I believe that anything you ask of God will be done. Your brother will rise to life. I know. He will rise again when everyone is resurrected on the last day. I am the resurrection and the source of all life. Those who believe in me will live, will live even in death. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never truly die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord. I believe that you are the anointed, the liberating king, God's own son, who we have heard is coming into the world. After this... Martha ran home to Mary. Mary, come with me. The teacher is here, and he has asked for you. Mary did not waste a minute. She got up and went to the same spot where Martha had found Jesus outside the village. The people gathered in her home, offering support and comfort, assumed she was going back to the tomb to cry and mourn, so they followed her. Mary approached Jesus, saw him, and fell at his feet. Lord, if only you'd been here, my brother would still be alive. When Jesus saw Mary's profound grief and the moaning and weeping of her companions, he was deeply moved by their pain in his spirit, and he was intensely troubled. Where have you laid his body? Come and see, Lord. As they walked, Jesus wept, and everyone noticed how much Jesus must have loved Lazarus, but others were ske skeptical. If this man can give sight to the blind, he could have kept him from dying. Then Jesus, who was intensely troubled by all of this, approached the tomb, a small cave covered by a massive stone. Remove the stone. Lord, he has been dead for four days. The stench will be unbearable. Remember, I told you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God. They removed the stone, and Jesus lifted his eyes towards heaven. Father, I am grateful that you have heard me. I know that you are always listening, but I procl pro uh, proclaim it loudly so that everyone here will believe you have sent me. After these words, he called out in a thunderous voice, Lazarus, come out. Then the man who was dead walked out of his tomb, bound from head to toe in a burial shroud. Untie him and let him go. As a result, many of the Jews who had come with Mary saw what happened and believed in him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now I would invite you uh, to bow your heads and pray with me. Lord, we are scattered and separated but you gather and connect us. We often feel closer to dry bones 
then to the full life that you have prepared for us. Fill us with the wisdom and power of your word. Guide us by your spirit and remind us that no matter the circumstances, you are present with us. Amen. Amen. Well, like many of you, I think I have been wrestling with a wide range of emotions and feelings as we've been uh, sort of trying to navigate this unprecedented time that we're all in the middle of. And as we were doing that, trying to do that, I came across a, a, an interview this week um, that was helpful to me. Uh, it was an interview with uh, the author David Kessler, and Kessler is, is maybe the world's leading expert on grief. And he was asked about this time we're going through, and he said that we're feeling a number of different griefs. We feel that the world has changed, and it has. We know this is temporary, but it doesn't feel that way. And we realize that things will be different, just as going to the airport is forever different from how it was before 9-11. Things will change, and this is the point at which they changed. That loss of normalcy, the fear of economic toil, the loss of connection, it's hitting all of us, and we're all grieving collectively. And he said, you know, we're not used to this kind of collective grief in the air of our society. And I think we're all grieving the loss of a lot of different things, the loss of connection, the loss of routine, the loss of special events that we were looking forward to. But Kessler says that we're also experiencing a different kind of grief, another kind of grief, and he calls this anticipatory grief. And anticipatory grief is that feeling that we get uh, about what the future holds when we're uncertain. And he says it usually centers on death, and we feel it when someone gets a dire diagnosis or when we have the normal thought that we'll lose a parent someday. Anticipatory grief is also uh, about the futures that we imagine. We know or we think that there is a storm coming. There's something bad out there. And with uh, the fight that we're in now with a virus, the kind of grief, this kind of grief is confusing for people. Our mind knows something bad is happening, but we can't see it. And it breaks our sense of safety and security. And I think we're all feeling that loss as well, that loss of safety and security. And so Kessler wasn't just about the bad news. He wanted to give some strategies for sort of how to navigate all of this. And he said that understanding the stages of grief is a start. And he said, so many of you might be familiar with the stages of grief. And so he explained that there is denial, right, which, which we say uh, a lot and we deal with a lot early on. And many of us have that, right? This virus, this thing won't affect us. And then there's anger. Uh, you're making me stay home. You're taking away my activities, my fill-in-the-blank there. Then there's the bargaining phase or stage. Okay, if I social distance for two weeks, then everything will be better, right? Then there's sadness. I don't know when this will end. And he said, Kessler said, it's important to understand that the, you don't go from one stage to another in a straight line. You often go back and forth, and you can experience them in any order. And he said, but finally, finally, there is acceptance. This is happening, and I have to figure out how to proceed. He said, acceptance, as you might imagine, is where the power lies. We find control in acceptance. I can wash my hands. I can keep a safe distance. I can learn how to work virtually. We can make this work. But Kessler just recently has added a sixth stage of grief. And it's an important one, I think, for us in this moment. And that stage is meaning. He said even though he was, Kessler was one of the ones that, that worked closely in developing these stages of grief, but he said 
He didn't want to stop at acceptance when he experienced personal grief. When he experienced a personal loss, he didn't want to stop at acceptance. He wanted to find meaning in those darkest of hours. And I believe uh, we all want to find light in dark times. And even now, people are realizing that we can connect through technology. You're here or there watching us here as we do this. We aren't all as remote and disconnected as we might have thought. We are remembering that those things we use for apps and games and everything else, you know, can call people. And we can talk on the phone uh, for a conversation longer than when will you be here. We can appreciate a walk, not having to worry about what time we left and what time we're getting back. And I think and I hope we will continue to find meaning now and when all of this is over. And as followers of Jesus, we know that there is something more than the stages of grief. There's something else that we have been given to process and to handle our grief and our trouble. It isn't a stage for us to pass through, but rather a beam of support that guides us through it all, that stays with us no matter what. And that is hope. In and through Jesus, we have hope. We have hope that this isn't the end. We have hope that there is more than this. We have hope that ultimately, ultimately, nothing can separate us from the love of God in and through Jesus Christ. We have hope that No matter what we experience, no matter what we go through, we are not now and we are never alone. That wonderful story we heard a moment ago about Jesus bringing Lazarus back to life in many ways is a story all about grief. And as such, I think it has something to teach us as we sit in this moment. Death and its sort of extended family, sin and despair, brokenness, loneliness, isolation, division, they are the enemies of life. They are the enemies of the life that we have been invited to in and through Jesus, not just everlasting life, but a full life here and now. And as Christians, we know and we believe that the final war against death has already been won, But we also know that the fight is not over and death is still a fearsome frontier. And our story, it peaks with the raising of Lazarus, but it it is also a story about his sisters, Martha and Mary, and their experience of grief and absence. Jesus, Jesus does not immediately come when they call. Jesus doesn't come when they call, and they both tell him. Can you imagine? They both tell him that their brother would be alive if he hadn't taken so long. So this story is, at least in the beginning, as much a story of lament and pain and grief as it will ultimately be a story about resurrection and life. And and we can't miss, we can't miss Jesus' response to Martha and Mary. Mary, who was so upset, she wouldn't come out to meet Jesus initially. Jesus doesn't tell them that they were foolish to mourn. Jesus doesn't tell them that they lack faith. Jesus doesn't take offense to the way that they question why he wasn't there. Instead, if you were listening, Jesus grieves with them. Scripture tells us that he was deeply moved and that his spirit was troubled by their pain and grief. And then, and then he did the most compassionate and the most human thing possible when confronting grief. He wept with them. So please hear this. If you are anxious right now, if you are worried 
right now, if you are afraid right now, it doesn't mean that you have somehow failed as a Christian. It doesn't mean that you're doing something wrong. It doesn't mean that you don't have enough faith. Instead, take heart. Take heart in the truth that Jesus is sitting with you in your worry, in your fear, in your anxiety as you're social distancing and stuck wherever you are. And now, as our social distancing is growing, as shelter-in-place orders are expanding, as more people get sick and layoffs increase, our anxieties heighten, and the end of this public health crisis seems too far off. We need the hope that the rest of this story offers us. We need the hope that comes in the little glimpse of Easter that is Lazarus' resurrection. What Jesus does for Lazarus is a foreshadowing of the hope that he is bringing for all of us at Easter. And we may not mark Holy Week uh, the way we normally do. We won't be celebrating Easter in our sanctuary this year. But nothing, nothing will prevent Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem. And nothing will prevent his living, breathing exit from the tomb. Nothing. Not social distancing, not global pandemics, not all the fear and the doubt and the worry and the anxiety in the world. Nothing can prevent his exit from the tomb. In this season of anxiety and terrifying headlines that come at us nonstop, this uncharted territory that we are all in. We who know the good news, those of us who have witnessed Lazarus unbound and resurrected, we who know in whom we have our hope, we have a responsibility We need to proclaim in confidence that God has not, does not, and will not abandon us. Jesus weeps with us. Our community mourns together. Jesus will not ignore our pleas to come and to help. And while we don't know when we'll return to this place so we can all be together in person or when we'll get to embrace each other uh, wholeheartedly, uh, or when we'll get to go back, back to work in our offices or find, or find our grocery stores or Target fully stocked with, uh, you know, even toilet paper. We don't know the answer to those questions, but because of the hope we have in Jesus, we can be sure that dry bones will become living, breathing human beings. We can be sure that the one who raised Jesus will sustain us even now, and Lazarus, four days in the tomb and decomposing, will make an astonishing return to his family and his community. This moment right now is a time to remember that Easter is coming and that nothing, nothing will stop God's power and nothing will stop God's plan to bring new life out of despair, and out of death. And in the meantime, those four days that must have seemed like an eternity for Mary and for Martha, in the meantime, in this in-between time, we must weep with those who weep, mourn, mourn with those who mourn, mourn the mounting communal losses together, call on Jesus for help, and pray to our Father in hope. And unfortunately, I don't think this season of strangeness will be a brief one. I hope our social distancing and the upending that comes with it flattens the curve and interrupts the rapid rise of COVID-19. But until then, until then, we are called to live in hope, trusting that because of Easter, Death and and evil, sin and suffering don't get to have the last word. While we are most definitely still in this moment in the valley of dry bones, rest assured, friends, 
Because, yea, though we walk through the valley of darkness, we need not fear evil, for God is with us. Jesus weeps with us. God is there to comfort us, and we are called to preach the good news until everyone has what they need so that they can stand on their own feet. Amen. As we think about uh, the hope we have in our God, let us affirm our faith in, the, in our God by saying together the Apostles' Creed. Uh, and I invite you to say it with me. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And uh, now I'll turn it back over to the band for our closing song.
want to thank you again for joining us. If you are interested and feel so led, at the end of this video, the video there will be uh, a link for our online giving. We invite you to, to do that and again as you feel led. Thank you for being with us and wherever you are, whatever you are going through, no matter how dry um, your life might feel, know that you are not alone and that in and through Jesus there is hope and life for you and for all of us. So go in peace. Amen.